So we need to begin our tour of the processes that affect our measurements by first considering the phase part of the mutual coherence function. It does count for 50% of the information that we can get access to and it turns out to be a very useful piece of information in order to constrain the geometry of the targets we're observing with interferometry. In practice, it turns out to be very troublesome to get access to, as we will see together just now. We will begin with the hopefully now familiar optical setup of a two-telescope interferometer observing at a target that is going across transit. We are going to assume that this interferometer with complete, is complete with delay lines and a good tracking system on our two telescopes to ensure that the light reaches our detector to within the coherence time. This is the little model that we've used to quantify the, uh, the behavior of our fringes. Um, in particular, I have highlighted the phase part of this equation, which turns out to be the argument of the cosine function used to describe the oscillation of our fringes. Now, the, this phase is made of two parts, the first uh, being something that depends on the current uh, instrument control system. For example, in the case of a coaxial uh, interferometer, which is the one I'm using for this little demonstration here, um, we simply have an, an optical path uh, difference modulator, an OPD modulator, uh, which is something that is controlled by the, um, the instrument control system that is uh, quantified by this function delta, which can vary with time. The other piece of info, the other part to this term is of course the target, the phase of the target being observed, which is the piece of information we are going after when, uh, when doing this type of measurements. Now there is a piece of information, a detail that we've overlooked so far, and that is the presence of the atmosphere above our interferometer. And um, in the same way, the presence of the atmosphere did affect uh, measurements of the images acquired by single telescopes, reducing diffraction-limited images to seeing-limited images. The presence of the atmosphere does also affect the performance of, a, of our interferometer. For even if the two telescopes used to do the interferometry are equipped with adaptive optics that stabilizes the wavefront within the uh, individual apertures, there can still be some leftover um, overall delay between the two telescopes uh, that is uh, going to uh, shift the position, offset the position of our fringes within a given direction. And that additional term that we need to uh, introduce into our model uh, referred to the atmospheric piston, is a time-varying function, which unfortunately can vary much faster than the integration time we use when acquiring our fringes. This comes with a, um, with a serious drawback, is that we experience some jittering of our fringes during a given integration, which means that uh, the integrated signal can look like fringes of reduced um, amplitude, which is something that we need to take into account again in our model, which we need to modify yet another time. And the way we do so is by introducing some sort of um, atmospheric amplitude gain right in front of the uh, visibility modulus mu in our equation. We're not going to talk too much about this right now, and we are really going to focus on the atmospheric piston part but it is important to keep in mind that uh, this uh, piston is also going to have uh, an impact on the visibility measurements later down. We can simply write uh, that the phase that we would deduce from our uh, raw interferometric data, um, the measured phase is can be expressed as the sum of two terms a first term that is intrinsic to the target you're observing, that is the piece of information you really would like to get access to, to which is added a, some sort of pollution term that is time variable um, 
that, that, uh, that was the atmospheric piston term. And it is a very sad reality that um, the two terms can, uh, cannot be isolated. And in practice, uh, the phase information acquired by a single baseline interferometer is simply lost and you never get to, uh, to get access to this thing. So in order to recover some of that phase information, we really need to uh, think outside the box and be very creative. And one of the solutions turns out to involve more than just two telescopes. And we're going to look at what's happening when uh, we monitor more than two telescopes, uh, the, the fringes that are acquired by more than two telescopes at a time. Now, the introduction of a third telescope uh, doesn't change anything to the presence of the atmosphere itself. And that third telescope is, of course, equally affected by the presence of the atmosphere. Yet something very interesting um, occurs that uh, will uh, give us uh, an idea of how that extra uh, piece of information can actually turn into something useful. We're going to look at the fringes that are simultaneously acquired by our three baseline interferometer here. Um, and uh, maybe to simplify things a bit, we're going to start by simply looking at what happens to our fringes when applying a, a piston term to one single aperture, and in this case, the aperture number one in our triplet. Now you see that the aperture one contributes to two of our three baselines. It, it contributes to uh, baseline uh, B12 and the baseline B31. The baseline 2-3 uh, does not require, does not use the uh, telescope number one and therefore is not affected by the measurement. What you notice, however, is that the amplitude of the offset that we measure on the, the, our fringe monitor uh, here is, is that the, the amplitude of the, uh, the, the offset on the fringe 1, 2 and 3, 1 are identical while the, the fringes 2, 3 have not been affected by this measurement. The same thing is true when you simply apply uh, a phase offset to uh, the, the aperture number 2 that also contributes to two baselines and not to the third. And the same thing occurs again uh, when uh, applying a, a, a piston term to, one, to the last of the apertures here. Now, it doesn't seem to help uh, all that much uh, simply by looking at this. However, uh, something very important uh, comes from the correlation that we've observed between the, the relative motion of the fringes. The fact that there is uh, a correlation between the fringe motion for the baselines that we've considered along this uh, triangle uh, has some very important consequences in practice. We can, in fact, write very simple equations that are simply extensions of what uh, I've introduced in an earlier slide that uh, show the equation, uh, the expression for the fringe, uh, the, for, the, for the phase measured on the three baselines simultaneously. And we see that for these three baselines, we have the exact same, um, the same setup where uh, the phase that we measure is always the, the sum of two terms, the first one being the phase, the intrinsic phase we'd like to get access to, and the pollution term here that we've simply explicited as each time being the difference between the uh, phase, between the difference between the two apertures. Maybe this correlation here is going to take some sense. Something very interesting occurs when uh, not considering those equations separately, but by simply adding them all together. What you see in getting so is that on the one side of the equation, you get the sum of the three measured phases. That's pretty obvious. And on the right hand side, you get at least the sum of the, first, uh, of the three uh, phases of the object you've looked at. Something very interesting occurs uh, 
uh, by looking at the piston term, you notice that the different piston terms simply cancel each other out when uh, combining those things uh, together. In the end, you're left with a new observable quantity, something that uh, is called the closure phase, something that was first developed for radio interferometry and then much later adapted to visible uh, optical interferometry. And the closure phase is this extraordinary observable quantity that is insensitive to the presence of the atmosphere.